And it gets your face like warmed up. Super serious. For nothing fun or funny ever, 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 ever happens. This is a super serious thing. I don't even like dogs. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Super Serious Dog Podcast, uh, hosted by Courtney Cuellar and my sh- myself, Misha Bielitsky. Um, We have some really exciting news for y'all today. We are officially on Apple Podcasts. Woo! Uh, it's very exciting. We're still working on getting on Spotify, but we're on Apple Podcasts slash iTunes, I guess. I mm-hmm. assume it's through iTunes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't remember. It's been long enough to me not having an iPhone that I forget how iPhones work all of a sudden. Go figure. (laughs) Wait. So, um, also if you guys, um, didn't know this, I have a boarding train today. (gasps) Yeah. Her name is, her name's Stella. She's hanging out with a, in a crate right now only because, um, she's still working through some things. Um, she's very new to my house and that's an important boundary that I often set that if I'm not supervising her actively she is confined in some way so either on leash or whatever you just got her yesterday right just got her yesterday and for those of you who have never seen a crate like this it's really intense looking and scary uh, but it's uh, it's called an impact crate it's basically designed to withstand a lot of um external force so a lot of times like i think this started as like a military use thing and then it became I think so it became mainstream. It looks military as hell. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but I, I was fortunate enough to be able to borrow one of these cause they are super expensive because Miss Stella has what I wasn't sure whether it was containment or phobia or separation anxiety. And that's one of the things that I was trying to figure out. So I figured we could talk about that and just general fear and anxiety and all that kind of stuff today because it's on the forefront of my brain cause I'm actively working through it. Yeah, um, I heard you didn't get much sleep last night. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> she she struggled. Uh, I basically got, I don't know if you can see, but I've got like a stack of pillows and blankets and Rocky's back there hanging out right now. But yeah, this is where I slept last night because she's not ready to be by herself. Um, but I figured maybe we can start with just kind of just general definitions, that sort of thing of containment phobia versus separation anxiety. I don't think a lot of people know that they're is a difference between the two or that even those things existed. I know separation anxiety is becoming a little bit more popular term. It's one of those terms that I hear people throw around probably a little more than they should. Just, Mm. you know, a dog that, that disagrees with being left in a crate. They're like, Oh, my dog has separation anxiety. Um, And it's like, well, does it really? Um, But it's, Right. Sometimes it truly does, but a lot of times there's a there's an other issues going on, and it's not true separation anxiety. Um, yeah. yeah, and and yeah, and that's not to say that like like you could you could say separation anxiety is like the act of being separate and having anxiety, but the definition of it is much deeper than that. It's more of like a systemic issue or a um, or, or not systemic, but like a chronic chronic issue. It's an illness, right? Just like anything else, just like any other kind of anxiety. Um, Stella, her background, definitely, she definitely has separation anxiety. She essentially, for the formative years of her life, she's about like eight or nine months-ish, maybe maybe seven at the youngest, um, was left outside, just chained up with a bowl of water and some shade and like minimal human interaction. And so any interaction that she gets, she relishes it because she's a, she's a super friendly dog. Um, and, and it's really unfortunate that she had to have that beginning into her life. But now that she's in a new home and all of her needs are getting met and life is wonderful. And she's with these people who love her very much. Uh, it's really, really hard to go away. And it's really hard to not, probably in her little doggy brain, think about, I don't know why, but I'm really worried when I can't see them. Because if you think about it, go ahead. I was going to say, so I want to talk about that for a second on on yeah. what's going on in her little doggy brain. Yeah. Um, because in, in the doggy brain, they are naturally pack animals and mm-hmm. they do almost everything together. There are exceptions and there are occasions where one pack member will go off and then they will return. But that happens very rarely um, and mm-hmm. for a specific reason. Yep. So it's not natural for dogs to have pack members that just leave the house for 
a bunch of number of hours, you know, and, and that's hard for a dog to understand. That is something that they have to learn to understand in our human world. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of people that have never experienced separation anxiety or containment phobia, you know, kind of take it for granted. Oh yeah, I go to work for eight hours and my dog just hangs out. Um, but there, there was a process of your dog learning that whether you were a part of it or not, um, that it's okay when you're left alone. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's a lot of techniques that, that help dogs understand that, you know, giving them a treat when you leave, right. giving them a, you know, thing to chew on that takes them a while right. um, and other stuff. But yeah. I just wanted to dive into why she panics yeah. so much because it's, it's understandable, right. right? Right, exactly. And And on top of that, I think you kind of started to touch on something too, is that like, it's not necessarily about like, oh, she, like, I, it was traumatic what she experienced, but she doesn't think that that was traumatic. That was all she knew for the first months of her life. That was just her life. entire. Yeah. That was just life. And now she's seeing a completely different picture all of a sudden. So even having that big of a shift can cause problems. We see it all the time with like reactive dogs who are super dog friendly when they're off leash, but they look like Cujo when they're on leash because they had a, a certain picture painted for them and now they're frustrated or then they became frustrated, which then turned into um, act, an actual stress response beside, beyond that frustration. So I don't think she has containment phobia, which is another thing that um, is starting to circulate a little bit more in, in common knowledge. Um, not as much as separation anxiety, but containment phobia is essentially what it sounds like. It's the, the fear, the extreme fear of being contained she's fine as long as I'm in the room. So she has no problems being in this crate or anything like that. And I know a lot of times people will kind of use like certain hallmarks. So they'll say, oh, is your dog chewing like windowsills and door frames, right? Because that means they're trying to get out. They know that that's a way out. She chews baseboards and windowsills, but it's because she was left tethered her whole life. She just chews. She was never taught not to chew. She was just put outside. Um, so it's, it, it's a very, you can tell the difference between, <laughs> she's groaning. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about you, boo. You can tell the difference a lot of times pretty quickly um, when it's containment versus separation. Like if I left the room right now, she'd start screaming. And it's not just that she starts screaming. She's a pretty vocal dog. <laughs> she makes a lot of noise. Um, but she started damaging the crate and tearing it up and like desperately trying to escape it whenever people leave the room. She's torn up the carpet. And it's, it's, it's really, really uh, scary and heartbreaking for a lot of owners to deal with. I know you've seen your fair share of that and had to sort of talk people down um, and through this process. <laughs> Yeah. Before. Yeah. Um, cause yeah, I mean, the process of working on it is not fun. Um, because you have to teach the dog that they can handle it little bits at a time. Mm -hmm. And that, that amount of time is going to vary based on a lot of, a lot of factors. Um, so there's a lot of work outside of just the containment and just the separation that you have to do so that your dog is mentally prepared and ready to handle what it doesn't want to handle. Um, yeah. so it's, it is an in-depth thing. There is no quick fix. There is no mm -hmm. one way fixes it every time um, because it always yeah. it always depends on the dog and where it stems from and what your relationship is and where you know what other bound what other stressors does your dog have to deal with and how good are they at working through stress mm -hmm. in general. So like, there's so much that there is to that that puzzle the the separation yeah. puzzle. Yeah, she's a surprisingly well-rounded dog. Um, she seems like she was around other dogs um, at, at some point because she gets along with them very naturally. She's been responding to B-Town perfectly, awesome. listening to him when he, he he grumps. So it's opened him up a lot faster too. And Rocky fell in love with her almost immediately, which was cool. But I digress. That has nothing to do with this. Um, the point is that clearly these people did care about her in some way. They did some things right, right? So it's not like like you know, the, the people who had her before are, are monsters, um, you know, cause people make mistakes too. A lot of people accidentally develop or create this type of behavior without even realizing it. Like a lot of us, 
right now we're seeing a lot of puppies and people are home all the time. And one of the biggest things that it's hard for people to wrap their brain around is like, well, why do I have to pretend to leave the house for a few hours? I don't have anywhere to go. And I'm like, because at some point you're going to have to do that. And if you don't start practicing now, your puppy's going to be completely stressed out when that moment does finally happen. And you're going to be dealing with you know, a very expensive board and train to fix it. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, I'm working with a client right now that has a puppy that, that they got during quarantine. Um, they have kids and seemed like a fun idea. And I mean, the kids have enjoyed it and everything, but um, her one issue that, that they haven't put the work into is her separation. And she barks when she's wants attention and when she's frustrated and I've, you know, where I'm giving them lots of coaching on how to work through that because it's only going to get worse. That's not something she's going to grow out of. You're um, by going and letting her out of the kennel or going and petting her when she's barking at you out of frustration is reinforcing the problem. And uh-huh. unless you want to see more of it, you need to stop doing that. Is literally what I told them. Right. Uh, so hopefully they listened. But um, I understand that it's frustrating and annoying to hear your dog whine or bark or or be upset mm-hmm. um but on a certain level those are feelings they do need to work through um yeah. like yep. humans we have to work through stuff all the time right anybody ever had anxiety or anything like that right mm-hmm. you you have to work through it you have to s- take deep breaths you have to talk to a therapist you need yeah you, you know you have to you have to do things you can't just yeah. run away and not deal yeah. with every single thing that makes you uncomfortable I mean, even things that seem like pretty minor too, right? Like you get into a minor fender bender on your way to work, right? This is pre-COVID, obviously. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's driving to work right now. But like, you know, you're you're on your way somewhere and you get into a minor fender bender. Nobody's injured. There's not even a scratch on anybody's car. It's still super stressful and like nerve wracking and adrenalizing. And like, it's it's difficult to not feel shaken up after something like that that's considered minor, right? Right. Um, so it's, it's the same thing. We deal with it in a lot of different ways, even if it doesn't necessarily lead to like a, a therapeutic type sort of intervention on your part and that sort of thing. So, right, right. It's just, you have to deal with that. Yeah. You have to call your mom and, and yell and be upset <laughs> or whatever, you know, whatever you have to do to help yourself through that moment. Um, your dog has to figure those things out too. Um, yeah, I think it's definitely hard for people to understand how important patience plays a role in dog training. I I think a lot of people get like, okay, I have to be patient. Things take time. You know, people, dogs don't learn overnight, neither do people and blah, blah, blah. But when you're actually in it, 30 seconds feels like hours. If you just sit there, especially when you have a barking dog and kids running around or you're in a conversation with somebody and, there's an uncomfortable silence, any of that kind of stuff. So, um, but yeah, with, with her. So I'm curious about like kind of some ways that you sort of start working through separation anxiety. So tell me what, what are some like early stage or, or mid stage type sort of things that you do when you first get a dog with issues like, like Stella? Uh, I mean, it's, it's hard. It's hard to just give like a, like a flat out game plan because I, let's assume that like the dog is perfect other than separation anxiety. Like in general, there's not right. Right. Imbalances. They're not, you know, they weren't abused. None of that kind of stuff. They just developed separation anxiety. I would want one thing that I may do. I'll put it that way. One thing I may do is I may work on the dog holding stationary positions like sit down or place and me stepping out of sight for like seconds at a time and then coming back and jackpotting the dog for staying um, and getting it so excited for me to step out of sight for a second that it, it... it actually gets yeah. that uh, good feeling when I step out of sight, you know, because it's like right. oh, she's going to come back any second and reward me <laughs> and and work within the threshold of what the dog can handle and make sure the dog stays successful at that. Um, and then throughout the board and train work on increasing those those times and, um, you know, that that's one thing I'm, I may do. That's one exercise. Yeah. I like that. I did that with her. I did a live um, video earlier and I was trying to like find the right camera angle, but it's hard in my house because it's like each room is kind of small. But yeah, I I basically was doing stuff like that. Um, I I also, a lot of times because that separation is associated with the crate because that's often recommended to crate train, but also 
the dog typically starts doing destructive behaviors when it's having anxiety. And so crate is often a common solution. So one of the things that I did with her right off the bat yesterday was lots of like, you're in the crate, but the door is open. Right. I either have a leash on you or the leash you're tethered through the crate somehow. Um, and, and you can enforcing step out. that. Are you enforcing she stayed in or let her yes. step out? Nope. I, I had her stay in. Like nice. if she like rested, if she lay down and her like snout was sort of sticking out, that's fine. Cause um, I wanted her to lay down. I wanted her to find a relaxed position. So at mm-hmm. first it was just staying in there for a second because like at first she didn't want to go in at all. So it was like, yay, you went in. Hooray, you did it. And then immediately second repetition was, okay, you go in there and like I kind of step towards her a little bit and then force her to, to stay in there and reward her for that. And then I get her to start doing that on her own. And right. then it was basically like, now I'm going to jackpot or only reward if you sit after you go in. And then eventually right. it was only if you lay down or just generally seem, seem relaxed, that sort of thing. And right. So, right. Um, any, any step towards being relaxed, you're rewarding. Yeah. yeah. It, got um, to a, it got to a point where she was so proud. She'd lay down and be like, what's next? <laughs> I did it. <laughs> um, another thing I would do, especially, I mean, it sounds like she's pretty food motivated, um, right. is like food puzzles and like Mm -hmm. snuffle mats or stuff, you know, like the pool with stuff in it. Um, Mm -hmm. Something to um, make her use her brain um, while eating and build that self-confidence that she can, you know, provide for herself and get her own food and she's doing dog stuff and, um, you know, and then following that with what you just did or what you were just talking about of having her hang out in the crate with the door open um, because that's going to empower her and make her feel good. And mm-hmm. then she's going to relax because that's yep. what she's going to want to do after in yep. the place where she's going to need to stay and be confidently calm, you yeah. know? So just yep. kind of br- bringing those together. Um, yeah. Uh, any, yeah. any self-confidence building. I mean, that's one thing that food puzzles do also is it builds their self-confidence. Yeah. Um, and that She's makes them smart. That makes Still them so uh, that. less reliant on their human for everything. Right. right. Um, so like ha- on, on one hand, hand feeding is really good because then all rewards come through you and the dog knows that. But sometimes with separation anxiety, I like to do independent work because then the dog knows it can work independently and I don't need Mm -hmm. to be there for everything. Mm -hmm. And um, depending on how sensitive she is, I would even practice stepping out of the room kind of casually while she's doing that, you know, Mm -hmm. and just coming in and out and coming back and be like, what? You're doing your own thing. It's cool. Like we can do things separately. We don't have to be together all the time. Yeah. I think it's important too, for people to know that it's not like, okay, you give them their Kong or their puzzle toy or whatever, and then you sneak out or they fall asleep finally and you sneak out because when they wake up, you're going to be gone. And just like a baby who wakes up in a crib by itself, it's going to go, bah, I need something, right? Right, right. Um, And so so that is not a good good trick at all. Um, One of the things that I've done a lot of while she's crated or while she's on place or just hanging out maybe with like my fiance, because it's funny, she's grown very attached to me very quickly, go figure. I'm doing cool stuff with her. Um, but she is just leave the room and let her kind of cry it out because there is a certain level of like, no, you need to learn to be self-sufficient. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm leaving and I'm still in the house, like calm down. And that's a big, big problem for her parents. Like when, when I went over there, I wanted to like kind of see an example of, of what it was like. And, and, immediately as soon as we closed the bedroom door what she was in her crate it was just screaming and crying and like trying to chew on the bars and all that kind of stuff and so Mm -hmm. she needs to learn like just because you're in your crate and we leave or the door closes or I'm in the other room doesn't mean you lose your mind but I think the other most crucial and important piece of this is when you come back in the room when you come back home for when you leave to not make a big deal out of it yeah don't rush to the dog and be like oh you did it yay Mm -hmm. um outside of that one training activity I talked about where you come back and you jackpot the dog like your rejoining with the dog needs to be neutral and just like chill because you're you're the point of being excited and jackpotting in that other instance, like when you're working on a sit or a down or places, because you're you're teaching the command, you're teaching the concept of holding that position, mm-hmm. and you're you're helping the dog through it. She, we're not asking her to do anything other than to exist within the space. That's right. it, right? Um, or or him, like the dog, because I'm talking about Stella right, right, <laughs> in mind. Right. 
Um, but yeah, and I know that's something that um, is is very natural for a lot of us. I mean, we get a dog and what do we want to do? We're happy when it's happy to see us. And, you know, we've had a long day or, you know, we were out at the grocery store and things are stressful because they were out of stuff or whatever. Right. Um, it's, it's hard not to do that, but you got to remain super emotionally neutral as much as possible. Um, because otherwise it's, it's detrimental. You're, you're creating your return as like the event. So when your dog is gone, (laughs) when you're gone, when you're yeah, gone sorry, when and your you're dog's gone. waiting for you, they're waiting yes. for the event. Yes. And yeah. when you make a big deal about you leaving and you're like, okay, be a good boy. Okay, be a good girl. Like, mommy loves you, right? And You're creating another event. Yes. And you're getting the dog riled up at your departure. And they're not, eventually they're not going to know why they're riled up. It's just a thing. And then that riled up state can turn into other feelings, other emotions, other things right and they could stay in that state longer than anticipated a lot of people are super lucky and they have dogs like rocky who are total couch potatoes and they're just like okay this is what i do now i go to bed i'll see you later to so come back <laughs> right. um and i get it when your dog looks at you and they're like sad it's hard and and there's nothing wrong with me like okay bye and giving them a quick pat or something but to not overdo it and it's certainly when you first come home like when I first come home, I say hi to the dogs real quick, but I f- go to the bathroom, I get some water, I go talk to Lee, I kick off my shoes, I do all kinds of things before I sit down and actually give my dogs any kind of attention or take them outside even. Same thing as like me waking up in the morning, like I may wake up and lay in bed for 30 minutes. It's not right. your cue to immediately rush outside. Right. Um, of course, there's consistency in my schedule. I don't like ruin their potty training or anything like that or make them hold their bladder for 12 hours or anything <laughs> excessive. Right. But still. Um, <clears throat> what, um, in terms of like, how do you tell people in a nice way that they're overdoing it on their escape or their, their <laughs> departure and their arrival back home um, when they're, they're having issues like this with their dogs? <laughs> I just tell them. I uh, I don't I don't have any special tricks of telling them. And anybody who is my client knows. I I'll just tell you something. Yeah, yeah. I, I may lead with. I hope this doesn't offend you. Um, <laughs> but usually not. I usually lead with. So what I see as being the problem here is very right. likely your actions. Yeah. So let's change your actions and see if the problem doesn't change, you yeah. know? And that's, right. that's, I mean, my, I'm pretty open with my clients. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's funny. I'm, <laughs> I'm always just curious to hear how people like talk about certain things, especially cause like every client's going to be a little bit different, right? right. So your approach right. is going to be different. <clears throat> just like my friends, right? My, if you get a bad haircut, I'm going to approach it differently than if like Lee had a bad haircut or, <laughs> you know, a, a, somebody who's just an acquaintance of mine or something like that. You know what I mean? Um, there's, there's plenty of people out there that are just like blunt as hell all the time. And I admire that, man. I wish I could be like that. I, I, I don't think I'm like that all the time, no, but no. I think if you're paying for my professional opinion, like I'm going to give it to you. Um, this right. is what I see. So. <laughs> right. Right. Um, have you ever seen your dog start to go down that rabbit hole a little bit of having some sort of separation anxiety or anxiety surrounding a very specific event, kind of like leaving. Absolutely. Uh, (laughs) hundred percent. Uh, so it usually happens if I have, um, a really busy schedule. Mm. Um, cause when I don't have a really busy schedule, my dogs are with me all the time. Um, they, we run errands together. We go hiking, we go do stuff. We go, you know, we're, we're always together. Um, they hang out on the floor usually, um, not in this room, but in the other, in the rest of the house, uh, they hang out on the floor, like near me, like we're always together. They follow some of them, follow me to the bathroom. Not all of them, but a couple of them do. Um, and then if I get really busy and I start leaving them more, I have actually, uh, I've had them tear up beds. Uh, uh, if if I've been kind of having someone on the back burner and I leave them in a comfy bed because I'm like, hey, here's a comfy bed for you. Uh, but they're bored and they haven't gotten what they needed. And I get reminded of that when I come back and the bed's torn up. And I'm like, oh, yep. 
that's yep. that's that my bad. I put you on the back burner and I should do that. But that's that's part of me trying to juggle five dogs and running my own business. Um, right. And Sounds having fun. a life also. So yeah. super fun, super easy. Yeah. Right. Anybody could do it. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I actually, I heard Reddy make this terrible noise. Have you, I, I don't know if you've heard the noise that Reddy can make when he's protesting mm-hmm. what I have done. Um, I don't know if I've heard, maybe I have, and I just don't, it's been long enough to where I don't remember It's this terrible it. banshee type scream <laughs> sound. Um, I've heard it. Okay. I know what you're talking about. I've heard that sound. Yeah. You wouldn't, I mean, it's like that, no way that came out of ready, but definitely he will make that sound, um, in protest to me leaving. That's hilarious. B-Town developed that a little bit, but only around specific events. Um, there was a couple of really bad thunderstorms that we had, um, back when I was at my previous company and like the, the training room had really tall ceilings and it was pretty echoey back there. And, um, you know, a lot of times going to work was stressful because there's a lot of dogs and a lot of people and that's not B-Town's most favorite situation to be in. Like he can deal Ever, with it. Either of those things. Right. Yeah. Um, he, he He's he's capable of making friends with people and dogs, but not that capable. Um, so, uh, yeah, and, and I noticed a very clear pattern develop where um, he would not want to stay on place anymore. He'd always run to the door. Usually it was to the front door because that's where I was going when I'd leave him in the training room because it was towards the back. Sometimes he'd run to the back door, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, even after um, not putting him in those situations anymore where, um, you know, I can't control the weather, but I can control like when, when I bring him and what I do with him, if there is a storm, that sort of thing. Um, there is a definite noticeable pattern of like storm anxiety, specifically when there was thunder. And honestly, I had to find, I, I had to think long and hard about what the best approach was because I, in one hand I could go full hundred percent. Okay. Trainer mode. We're going to train the shit out of you and work through this. But the other part of me was like, well, this sort of developed in a specific environment. That environment doesn't exist anymore. And if I don't bring too much attention to it, that'll also help the problem sort of go away. But I did still have to work him through it some of the time. Mm-hmm. So I kind of found this really nice balance of like not, overtraining, but also not just being like, well, maybe he'll grow out of it. Right. Cause that's the thing we hear all the time is like, maybe, maybe he will. Right. Cause there's plenty of success stories where that happens. <laughs> Some the behaviors puppy, dogs do grow out of. Yeah. Mouthing is a big one. I feel like people expect dogs to grow out of, so they don't really work on it, but yeah, it rarely goes away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That one sometimes gets worse. <laughs> oh gosh. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of hard when you're a nice, cart, kind-hearted person and you got this dog to be your companion and now your companion is clearly hurting. Um, but I think it's definitely super important to realize when you're just uh, sort of giving into your dog too much mm-hmm. um, and not upholding certain boundaries and you know not being able to sort of what I was talking about earlier, leave the room, let your dog whine, come back in, completely ignore them and keep doing what you're doing and wait for them to calm down before you give them any attention. And honestly, I would suggest like zero attention whatsoever. I don't know if you would agree with that. Um, Probably. Yeah. In that specific scenario, because I'm not, I'm not going that far. Um, But it's, um, I was going somewhere with that specifically. Oh, but just about kind of protest behaviors in general. So a lot of times um, we see a lot of people with those symptoms of like the dog protesting and constantly getting its way. Yeah. So, so I've had a couple of people uh, before come to me and, and I'm sure this is kind of what doctors feel like when people have been on Google too much and they come to <laughs> me and they tell me what their dog's problem is. Um, by all means, give me a heads up. Let me know. I love information. It's not going to hurt. Um, but some people just have a way of saying things. You know what I mean? Anyway, uh, so the people have told me that their dogs have separation anxiety. And then we start to talk because I, I always have questions, you know, like, what do you do with your dog? What's your dog's daily life like? Like, what kind of activities do you like? Um, what's your dog like inside the house? What's your dog like going out? What's your dog like on a walk? All these things, right? Um, and more often than not, 
when someone knows that their dog has separation anxiety, their dog actually is just throwing a tantrum uh, and is protesting them and actually pushes them around through most of their interactions in their daily life uh, and is literally just disagreeing with the fact that they left the house yep. and just throwing a fit. Yep. And, and what typically happens when those tantrums get addressed inappropriately, so aka the dog wins or whatever, for lack of a better phrase, right, is that those tantrums get bigger and bigger and uglier and uglier each time because your dog has so many successes in that behavior and in acting that way to the point where the next time you finally say, you know what, this time you're not allowed on the couch anymore and your dog throws a fit, and you're like, nope, I'm going to be strong. I'm going to do this. Then eventually at some point you cave because you're, you don't, it's hard. It's difficult. They look sad. They look sad, right? There's so many different reasons why people falter, right? Maybe work gets out of the, in the way and, and like, you know, you tried your hardest, right? But still wasn't enough, right? Hey. Um, it, it wasn't enough. Like it, it, that's how that behavior grows stronger is when you do finally cave because they finally got to that point. What you're looking for typically is, is what's called an extinction burst. Super cool term. You should Google it. Um, but it's essentially where it's that last ditch effort to finally give it all you got. So usually when there's a tantrum, there's kind of like a steady rise of the behavior of the, um, the action, the whatever. Um, and essentially there's usually a little dip and you're like, cool, things are on the up or I guess the down. Right? People, if you will. people usually let their dog out on the dip. Dip, right. But you got to keep going because there's always a super sharp rise and it's like the worst, like it's, it's higher or more intense or louder or whatever, more desperate essentially than the, the peak before the dip essentially. And that's essentially the extinction burst. That little tippy tippy top of the roller coaster before you go down and go wee mm -hmm. through all the loops. Um, and the reason why that's so important is to not go out on the dip is because you haven't really made a breakthrough. Your dog needs to get that last ditch effort out of their system and realize that that still didn't work before you go let them out. And that's the hardest thing about separation anxiety is that like, it's not even a tantrum. It's just, there's no it, there's not as clear of a pattern for you to follow mm -hmm. um, as a tantrum. Right. Um, because it's, it's generalized anxiety at that point. Right. 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 <laughs> that was a good chat. Yeah. Do you have to add? Uh, if you think your dog has separation anxiety, call a dog mm. trainer. Yep. Call a dog trainer. They can definitely help you they sort can it out. Give you, they can help you figure out if it actually is or what it actually is and give you tips on how to work on whatever it is. Uh -huh. um, but don't let your dog hurt themselves in the kennel. And right. um, I mean, I know they make kennels like that, but like they're really noisy. They're really big. Uh, they're heavy. Expensive. They're expensive. Uh, you don't want that to be your answer. Like that's not, that is not fixing anything. Uh -huh. um, Misha has that because of safety and you know, the dog, the dog needs to learn. So it's going to work through it with that kind of kennel. But I think the uh -huh. ultimate goal is for it to be okay in a regular kennel. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's good. Good moral of that story for sure. Um, and you know, it's, it's one of those things like, like Courtney said, if you're not sure, it doesn't hurt to ask, right? There's plenty of trainers who will probably tell you over the phone if it's very obviously not separation anxiety, right? right. Um, during the consultation process. But also a lot of them are doing um, like virtual. There's tons lessons. of virtual stuff right now. Almost every dog trainer jumped online. So you I'm can- I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah, I am too. So uh, if you need help, like Google some dog training in your area or- mm -hmm. Yep. dive in and do more research um help, yeah. you, help yourself and help your dog yeah for sure <laughs> 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 all right guys well thank you so much for tuning in um and seriously please if you guys are enjoying this rate our podcast on whatever platform that you follow it on um write a review about it um you know we will read it we will respond we will tell a joke if you want us to. <laughs> oh, we also, I, we, we made a post on our Patreon asking some questions. So if you're yes. a Patreon person, 
See if you go answer one of those questions. And if you're not a Patreon person, maybe you should fix that about Mm -hmm. yourself. You can fix that by going to patreon.com slash super serious dog podcast. You can also search for it if you just go to patreon.com. Um, and there's different tiers. You get extra stuff. There's interviews with people. There's all kinds of really, really cool stuff on there. Cool content. Um, but also if you just, you want to support us, but you don't have the monetary means to do that, writing reviews, liking and rating and thumbs upping the YouTube video, all that kind of stuff is super helpful. So that way we can get our message out there and hopefully find other people like you who would love to, to hear about this kind of stuff. So thanks for y'all support and, um, you know, really appreciate it. See you next time. Boop, 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 boop.